towards the basket. It's tipped, and the game clock runs out, and Monmouth goes on the road, and they stun the Cincinnati Bearcats, winning in fifth third bank arena, 61 to 59. Welcome back to the Monmouth Basketball Hawks Nest Podcast. That sound was courtesy of Monmouth Hawks Athletics, <clears throat> voice of Eddie Acapenzi on the Monmouth Radio. Huge, huge week for the Monmouth Hawks basketball team. You had wins over Princeton at home and a massive program win over Cincinnati on the road. Won that last week, I said. I feel like if we can beat Princeton, we might just have a shot against Cincinnati. And it was a huge, huge win. We'll get to that game a little bit later. Prince, the game comes first. But, Mark, how are you feeling after those two wins? I don't think the smile has left my face since about 4 o'clock on Saturday. Uh, just an, another unbelievable win in a big-time power conference arena for this small school from central New Jersey. Unbelievable run. Yeah, I mean, coming into the week, you're 3-1. You're feeling pretty good. And Princeton coming off two major, major wins versus high major teams. And then an overtime loss versus Minnesota from the Big Ten. You're like, this is going to be kind of a tough game for us, even at home. And, you know, at some at one point in the game, Mount, I believe, was down 12 or 14. And after that, they got to seven at halftime against Princeton. And they never looked back after that. I mean, for a little bit, you thought Princeton might have a chance to run away with the game. But Pappas and the crew just kept on just keeping themselves in the game, and they never let it get out of hand. They got to seven and a half time, and they just kept forcing Princeton into bad shots and the turnovers. And in the end, they, they got a convincing one. It wasn't even – it came down to the wire. The last 10 minutes weren't really even that close, and you just kind of knew Mammoth had that game, which I felt, you know, you can disagree with you if, if you think. I think we're on the same page here. I felt if we were going to win that game, it was going to come down to the wire. I did not expect a double-digit win over Princeton. No, and Princeton came in, like you had said, with a, an extremely impressive resume. Um, and they they looked every bit the part of a giant killer and an elite mid-major basketball team in the first half. Uh, in the first half, Princeton shot about 50% from the field. They kept um, – they scored 46 first-half points. Uh, they kept on getting the screens, and Monmouth was falling into those bad switches – off the screen action again. They got a couple backdoor plays. Um, at Princeton, Princeton looked really, really good in the first half. But as good as Princeton looked in the first half, Monmouth looked that good and better in the second half, thanks to a stifling defense, which held Princeton to just 18 points in the second half. That's Monmouth, unreal. Monmouth adjusted. They started jumping the guard off those screens rather than switching. Um, which then they were forcing the Princeton bigs to both make decisions or make a move to beat them rather than letting the guard ISO one-on-one -on -one with the opposing bigs, which is a strategy that Monmouth ended up using part of the Cincinnati game as well. I think they're much better playing defense like that. The problem is if you do that every single time, um, a team with a good decision-making big man or a nimble big man is going, to, or a good jump shooting big man is going to eventually burn you. So I think King Rice was picking his spots back and forth in both of these games with the way he defended. Uh, Monmouth won the rebounding battle against Princeton, 41-40. Um, Monmouth only had seven turnovers and they forced 12. And they just stayed very calm and came back, like you said, after being down double digits. Um, what was great about this game, Ryan, is that there were over 2,200 people in attendance for what is a great game and a great series. And it didn't just bring out Monmouth fans. It brought out Princeton fans. And it also brought out, you could tell, some casual basketball fans. who You're looking around the arena and people are nodding or clapping at things that both of the teams did because it's just a really good basketball game every time these two teams meet up. And it sounds like as long as these two head coaches are staying at their respective Jersey schools, this series should continue and benefit everyone involved. Yeah, and you know what? Why wouldn't you play the game? Because you're less than an hour away. You're probably 40 minutes away from each other, and you're never going to have a problem with another's RPI or net ranking because typically Monmouth and Princeton are in the top few teams in their conference almost every year. So why would you not play that game? It's not going to be like a quadrant four win or loss where 
either way, like it's a garbage team in the, you know, the, the bottom 50 to 100 teams in the country where it's going to cost you for a bid. I mean, it, it doesn't even matter. Like it's a great rivalry. It's a great um, two teams going at it that are both very capable teams every year. So I don't know why you wouldn't keep doing it. I, I would like to see us keep doing that with other teams in the state, but some teams, you know, want to keep playing the Division three schools and, you know, teams that were just Division one for a couple of years. So, you know, certain schools don't really want to play Monmouth anymore, but we'll, we'll leave that at that for tonight. We have more to talk about. Yeah, so notable storylines from this one. George Pappas went off, and that kid feeds off of the home crowd. His performances at home versus away – um, have been pretty drastic this year. 20 points, eight rebounds. He shot efficiently, seven for 14 from the floor, four of 10 from three, and hit both his free throws. I, I don't know, Ryan, if there's ever been a player that feeds off of the Ocean Verse Bank Center floor more than George Pappas. I mean, he loves it. He absolutely loves that environment. And I mean, you, you see, once he gets going, he gets so comfortable. And you know, on the road, like we'll talk about the Cincinnati game a little bit more, but when he's at home, he just takes over a whole different persona. I mean, everything changes with him. And you saw that sometimes with Ray and Dion and even Justin sometimes. And, you know, it's a little different for George. I feel like he plays a lot better at home than he does on the road. He hasn't played poorly on the road at all, but at home, he just becomes a completely different beast. It's just so hard to stop him. It's like, it's like the court at Monmouth gets like 50 feet wider and their transition game just kind of opens up for him. And, they just find him in transition the whole entire game where he dribbles and pulls up from 28 feet. I mean, he, he is so, so tough to stop at home. And I think teams just kind of throw their hands up. Like, all right, we try to guard this guy. We try to, you know, put one on one and have somebody else shadow him to help out. We try to get back in transition. It doesn't matter. He either pulls up or finds his way around for an open shot and coaches are throwing their hands up. Like, what do we do with this guy? So, I mean, he, he's just tough to stop. Yeah, and he waves and he winks at the people that he knows in, <laughs> in, in, in the state seats. I, I just love it. Um, before we move on from George, just quick shout out to our friends, the Robinson brothers at All Facts Media yep. and George Pappas. They had him on for an interview in their latest podcast. And uh, I did post it in the Facebook group and I did retweet it on Twitter. Definitely a great sit down for Mama fans to listen to. George talks about going through the portal process and ultimately choosing that Monmouth is home and it just felt right to go back, his allegiance to Coach Rice, how supportive Coach Rice was for him during the transfer portal process, actually assisting him in uh, looking at other places and using his contacts. He actually had him in contact with UNC before Roy Williams retired that, because that was George's, um, he said it's his dream school. So just the character of King Rice really shines through and the uh, further appreciation for George Pappas coming back. You know, um, sorry, oh, go ahead, real quick. Um, this, th there will be a lot of King Rice praise on this podcast for a few reasons, but I mean, it, it is, you know, listen, I know we haven't been to the tournament. I know people are frustrated with that, but it is impressive the patience that King does have with some of these guys, because you look at a guy like George and a guy like McClary and their freshman year, which is five years ago now, you know, they get on the court, and I think it was very fair to say they looked like they didn't belong. They looked like they were fringe Division two, Division three players. Like, they just didn't look like – like, McClary had zero offensive game, like, really just, like, negative offensive game. George couldn't hit whatever he fell out of a boat. He, he couldn't hit a shot. And, you know, he, at that point, he wasn't as great of a defender. He wasn't – um, as smooth dribbling the ball up and down the court. He was a little bit sloppy with it and didn't really look like, you know, he knew the part of playing shooting guard in Division One. And both of those guys just didn't look like they belonged here. But slowly but surely, their sophomore year, they pick up a little steam. Junior year, George becomes a, a star. McClary's picking things up again. And last year, they both played great. And this year, look at what they're doing. I mean, George Pappas is probably the best player in the MAC right now, stat-wise. And... Marcus McClary isn't far behind him. Marcus McClary, <laughs> if you were to end the season today, he's got to be fighting for a top second team or third team spot because, look, he's had multiple 20-point games, and he's the reason we are 5-1. I mean, it's a, it's really a testament to what King's done, and first of all, development part of it, but also the patience because their freshman year, it was not there at all, and 
look what these guys are doing in their fifth year. It, it's really impressive. Yeah, I remember King Rice gushing about that full freshman um, freshman class when you add Malik Martin and Deion Hammond to it. And he kept saying, as good as Justin's class was, this class, when you put them one through four up against each other, he kept saying this was going to end up being the best class in Monmouth history. And, um, you know, uh, Malik had a huge year last year. Deion Hammond had multiple great years. And now George and Marcus with this bonus year, it, it might actually come to fruition that uh, King Rice might be correct on that. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. We've heard uh, the Michael Jordan flu game. Well, we had the Shavar Reynolds flu game. Shavar barely practiced all week, couldn't attend shoot around, had to come off the bench. But when he was in there, he delivered big time. 16 points, five boards, efficiently shooting at six for 12, four for seven from three. He took over the game at one point in the second half. He hit three threes in a row. And it allowed Mammoth to take overtake the lead and led to a Princeton timeout. Just a gritty, outstanding performance from this kid who, as each game goes on, I think he gets closer and closer to the alpha that we thought he was going to be here in West Long Branch. Yeah, and you know what? I think what's also going to get lost in this game, first of all, I mean, again, Shavar played an outstanding game every game. He's just as steady as it goes. We'll talk about the foul trouble in a little bit. In a little bit, we got to get to that. But Shavar has just been everything you could possibly want in a fifth-year transfer, a leader. This kid just gets it. He, the only thing this kid wants to do is win. He does not care how many times he gets the ball, how many shots he gets, if the ball's in his hands at all. He doesn't care. This kid just wants to win. But what's going to get lost in this game, in terms of people looking in from the mid-major college basketball and college basketball as a whole that looked at this game. Is oh wow, Monmouth beat Princeton. That's a great win for them. Two good mid-major teams. Well, Monmouth didn't have Miles Ruth playing defense. He was out, and they didn't have Nikkei Ruddy playing at the four, which showed early because there was no other. Like, listen, Foster played well in this game, but Walker Miller was kind of left to deal with both big guys, and it was the first time we kind of saw him exposed defensively a little bit. They just kept backdooring Walker and getting great position under the basket all game. And it was driving you nuts because they just kept doing the same thing. They kept getting underneath Walker. He would get one drop step in on him, make a couple pump fakes, get around him. And they were abusing Walker all night, at least for the first half. So you saw Nick K. Ruddy was dearly missed when that was going on. And, you know, they made some adjustments in the second half, obviously. They held him to 18 points, which is unheard of in any college basketball game. But for this team to go out without Ruddy and without Miles Ruth, and still kind of spank Princeton in the second half and get a double-digit win, that's what's getting lost here. It's not that they beat Princeton, who just beat two high-major teams and almost beat Minnesota on the road. It's that they beat them without two key pieces in the lineup. So, you know, if those guys are playing the game, I mean, who knows? It might be a 20-point win and a blowout. So it's it's really, really impressive what they did in this game with what they had. And I think that it's easy to overlook what Nikkei Ruddy and Miles Ruth bring to this team. Yes. And you notice it when they're not there. So I mean, you look at, uh, you look at the box score and you see Nikkei Ruddy. Oh, he's just another guy. You know, he averages two or three points a game and he'll get a six or seven rebounds and a couple of blocks, but you don't realize what he does defensively and setting screens. And he, he's that kind of just mid piece that you need on a team. He's, he's not going to give you 15 points and 12 rebounds. It's not who Ruddy is. But he's just that hard worker that's going to do all the dirty work, not get credit for any of it, but it makes a big difference in the end. Yeah, so Foster, I thought, played really well offensively at 9.6 rebounds. Definitely some struggles chasing the Princeton undersized fours on the other end, um, which was cleaned up in the second half. But Foster, this, this is the problem with Foster. It's that you know he can score. You know he's a problem offensively. You know he has a seven foot four wingspan, but is only six six or six seven as a big man. And it's it's defensively. He's a little small to defend opposing fives, and he's a little slow to defend some of those small ball fours. So those are the things he has to improve on. But uh, you know he did some yeoman's work out there filling in, and then probably out of all the reasons that they won this game, probably a guy who's almost been a forgotten man here. Sam Chapu yep. played 28 minutes after really being the last guy, the end of that eight-man rotation for most of the year going into this game. And he stepped up in a huge way. He had 10 points, 
four assists and four steals. Uh, what an impressive performance for a guy who really hasn't had that much of a role this year to be delivered immediately when called upon. And I know King Rice keeps saying these are grown men, these are grown men. That's something that a guy who's in his fourth year has been through. Being a starting point guard, being a backup point guard, being a role player, having 30 minutes a game. He's been through it all. And all of that experience definitely kept him ready. And kudos to him in his attitude and his basketball IQ to be able to step in and run the show for most of the game. I mean, if, if you thought that he wasn't going to get his, his, his money he was worth with the minutes that he was getting finally, I mean, you're out of your mind because this kid plays bad. This kid can play basketball. You know, he's never been the superstar at Monmouth, but this kid has a high IQ. He's a hard worker. He's a floor general. This kid can play basketball. And, you know, coming in really as the third string point guard because Miles Ruth was started last year, Shavar takes over the starting spot. Really, Chapu is third in the pecking order. And if you thought that didn't motivate him a little bit, you know, I'll tell you what, it looked like that kid wants minutes. I mean, the way he was, he was playing with his hair on fire. The one, he, he jumped the pass at half court, steals the ball. He was he's either a little shuffle pass or around the back to McClary, who almost took the rim off. I thought it was going to be the fourth center. It was one of the best plays we've seen, the best highlights of the year so far. Um, I think if there were 4,000 st- people at Ocean First Bank Center, it was, it was a full crowd. That place would have exploded. Um, it felt like it exploded with 2,200, but 4,000, that place would have been crazy. Um, but it was a real highlight, highlight real moment. And, you know, Chapu was playing his butt off. I mean, you need guys like that. And it just shows that when Mammoth has foul trouble and Shavar gets into foul trouble, you have Miles, you have Sam. And that's what championship teams need. You can't be dead when one of your guys gets into foul trouble. You can't be dead in the water and not have a backup plan. And Mammoth has two backup plans. And you can play them side by side with each other and still hold, you know, hold yourselves above water and not completely sink without your star in there. So Sam Chapu is going to be a big piece of this team going forward. So Sam Chapu might have been the backup plan, but here comes the backup to the backup plan. Yeah. Because enter here uh, prior to the game, I was lucky enough to bump into APP uh, writer Steve Edelson. I said to him, I said, Steve, uh, it looks like so and so is out. And he's looking at me, saying, oh, yeah. And I'm going, what do you think they're going to do? And I said, Steve, I really think the next guy up, they're going to have to play this stud freshman, Teron Allen. I really think he's going to have to play. And boy, boy, do I feel smart after that conversation. Because <laughs> Teron Allen comes in and he is shot out of a cannon. This kid is pounding the boards and going at 110 miles a minute, a, a miles per hour. He is just throwing his body and flashing such superior athleticism and youthful exuberance in this one played 15 minutes and you saw some really good. You saw the four points, the, uh, the offensive rebounds, five rebounds altogether. And then you saw his youth and why he's not playing a major role. He missed a layup. There was some uncertainty on different plays on the offense and the defensive side, but, but wow, that kid's future looks bright. I think that next year he is primed to slide into the Marcus McClary role. Oh, I completely agree. He he looks poised and he looks like he belongs out there. He's a strong kid. He's actually a pretty quick kid. But, you know, his body size doesn't really show like quickness, but he is a quick and a tough kid. And he does a little bit of everything. He's not the biggest guy, but he can shoot the three a little bit. He makes some inside shots. He rebounds. He drives. Like He, he really, really is a spark plug for this team. And it's one that we saw coming in. We thought he was going to be one of the better freshmen. But I didn't quite expect him to have the kind of impact he has over the last week or so. And having that guy as your ninth guy, I'm, I'm telling you guys, people can say all they want about Iona. This mom team is really deep and adding to Ron Allen to that mix. And then you add eventually Vuga and Jarvis Vaughn and a couple of the other freshmen they wind up getting on the court. This is going to be a deep team. It's not there yet, but it's going to be. And they can talk about Iona and Patino all they want. They got to come through us too. And January 9th, is not going to be a layup for them. I'm telling you right now, it's going to be a nasty game, and it's going to be a difficult game for both teams, but I don't expect Iona to walk over us at all this year. So Walker Miller, like you said, he had a little bit of a tough one in, in yep. this game. Ended up with, but still ended up 8.7 boards, two blocks. So this just talks, it talks to the level that we've come to expect from him, that we're saying he had kind of a tough game, and he was close to a double-double and had two blocks and really played strong down the stretch of the game. 
And then McClary really didn't shoot it well in this one. Nine points, six boards, kind of just gutted it out. And like you said, hey, out of those nine points, he did have that highlight reel dunk where the Princeton defender was about to get dunked on and kind of made a business decision and kind of ducked out of the way. Uh, what a great look by Chipu. And what a big time finish finish from Marcus McClary. That would have been, remember, I believe it was his sophomore year when he had the breakaway against Iona and he missed the dunk. Yeah. And Iona ended up going on like a 15 to two run. And you and I went nuts about the fact that <laughs> just lay the ball up. Why are you? Uh, and now it just shows how far he's come. Um, great win for the program over a Princeton team that, like we had said, had knocked off multiple power five schools coming in and should be among the top teams, if not the best team I've seen, I've watched Harvard play. I watched Harvard play against Iona. I think Princeton's better. I haven't seen Yale yet. We'll see Yale later this year, but um, from, from the, the two contenders I've seen, I think Princeton is deeper and is better. Harvard's very top heavy with two stars and then a bunch of younger role players. Um, and for as big of a win as the Princeton game was, oh, man. I'll let you take it away on the next win there, Ryan. So we moved to from Wednesday to Saturday at Cincinnati. It's a game I really felt like if we could just play well defensively and stay within arm's reach, we had a shot in this game. And Mammoth takes them down. Walker Miller versus Wes Miller, his older brother, the head coach over at Cincinnati. And I think he's glad this happened after Thanksgiving and not before Thanksgiving because it would have been an awkward dinner conversation for Wes after that game. Walker would have been smiling the whole time, and Wes would have been pretty pissed off the whole time. But Mammoth gets the win, 61-59 on the road versus a team that if they had won that game, there probably would have been in the top 25 this coming week. People were saying that they should have been in last week and that if they had beaten Mammoth, they definitely would have been in this week. So this is a top 30, top 35 team. And, you know, Monmouth just never let them get away. Like it got to six or eight points a few times. It felt like we just weren't going to get over that six to eight point hump. You know, every, every time we hit a three, got to six, we would turn over. They'd score a basket. Get to eight, ten. It just didn't feel like we were going to get past that six point. Then we got to four and it was back to six. And eventually we just kept climbing back in and Cincinnati couldn't get rid of us. And it, it's just amazing how a team that just beat – um, Illinois, who was ranked like 15th in the country, they lost to a very. They beat them by 20. By they 20. ran Illinois out of the gym, and then they lose to a, a ranked Arkansas team by a few points. And I, I mean, to do that to that team on the road was just amazing. 59 points given up to that kind of team with Shavar and foul trouble. All right, now <clears throat> I have been saying this since I've been a Mama fan because I've seen it too many times. Even when Mama stunk like my sophomore or junior year of college, which was, you know, eight, nine years ago now. Um, they played at Maryland. We were down, I think we were down one. Brees Cafani got bodied, like, into the scorer's table by Maryland center, and they called a foul on Cafani, who got hit instead of the other guy. So instead of us getting free throws and possibly taking the lead with under a minute to go, they got free throws, made it three, of course, you get a turnover and things spiral. They won by five or six. So I've always said, in order to beat a high major team on the road in their building, you've got to play the game like you've won by 10 points in order to win by a single point. Because that's what it takes. The refs are not going to give you an ounce of grace at any point. And you're playing five on eight, especially at the end of the game. They're not going to give you calls. So the fact that Monmouth went in there and won this game, and truthfully, the, the calls were not great. It wasn't the worst I've seen. But we were not getting calls. Um, but, I mean, to do that and go in that environment and just not let the lead get too high, um, it's also a testament to King Rice, too. I, don't, I haven't seen your notes for this game yet, but I mean, King, King Rice, over the week, he coached – and Steve has asked that on Twitter, too. He coached a masterful couple of games. This, this may be the best two games in a row that King Rice has coached at Monmouth because – I mean, he, he just pushed all the right buttons, the subs, making adjustments, calling timeouts. He called timeouts. It's amazing. I mean, you see what happens. I mean, he just coached an excellent two games this week, especially Cincinnati. I mean, he pulled all the right strings, and it just worked out in the end. Yeah, pretty impressive. Monmouth was able to pull this off, and there were over 8,200 
fans and that building got loud. It got it did get loud. Really bringing, you know, trying to will the Bearcats back into it. But I agree with you. I'm going to go one step further. I'm going to say that this game was the best in-game coaching performance of King Rice's Mammoth career. I would agree. Uh, I thought that the way that he switched up defenses, he navigated the foul trouble for his main guys, Shavar and Walker Miller. He dealt with his top gun, George Pappas, um, being t- pretty much taken out of the game by uh, Cincinnati's defense. And he just made excellent halftime adjustments and led this team to victory. Um, really great growth for King. Mom has shot eight of 16 from three, 50 percent. Are you ready for this? Compared to Cincinnati going four of 28 at a robust 14 percent. That's <laughs> hard to do, Four for, I think I could go four for 20. <laughs> and a lot of those ended up when Monmouth went into the junk zone, they were, they were banking on Cincinnati missing those threes and taking those threes to take away their, uh, their uh, inside and their drives. And, uh, you know, King kind of, he rolled the dice a little bit with it and worked out. Uh, and kudos to Monmouth for out rebounding a bigger, stronger, more athletic Bearcat squad. 38-36. Um, one bad thing, although they won the battle of the board, Cincinnati got 13 offensive rebounds. You really got to put your body on somebody. I know these are elite level athletes, and maybe besides Iona, you won't be seeing that type of uh, player on the interior. Uh, maybe Marfo from Quinnipiac, that's it. Um, they only forced five Cincinnati turnovers, and Monmouth committed 15. And here are those refs. Monmouth only took eight free throws, and they only made five. <laughs> and the fouls in this game were 19 on Monmouth and nine on Cincinnati. There and that's go. with Monmouth playing a bunch of zone defense in the second half. So some of them were really questionable. I have a couple in my notes here that I thought were really awful calls. Shavar dove on a loose ball where he didn't even jump on the on the uh, Cincinnati player. He dove on the ball and the ref called a foul. Bam. No one ever calls a foul. And that's always a jump ball unless you literally fall on top of them and Shavar dove at an angle to where his body fell on the ball, where the Cincinnati defender was kind of holding the ball over his head while laying on the ground. So bad job by the refs there. Um, Shavar being called for a block on what was an obvious charge. He didn't move. His third foul. He literally didn't move. He was standing there. <laughs> yeah, he was just, I mean, he beat the man to the spot by five seconds. And then um, one more, which this one was a little dicey. Walker Miller, it looked to me like he got set. And he got called for a block, a block late in the second half, uh, where they called it, they where it probably could have been a charge. So, um, like you said, you're not only playing against the 8,200 fans, you're not only playing against the five men who are on the floor plus those top 100 recruits on the bench that are coming in, cycling in and out for them. You're not only playing against a great coach in West Miller, but you're playing against three referees as well. So. It's eight on five when you're out there against these power conference schools. And unfortunately uh, for Monmouth, you know, it, and all mid-majors, it happens way too much where these games are taken away from them. I don't know if the, the refs are swindled by the, the arena and the fans and the moment, or they're swindled by the, the superior physicality of these bigger, uh, bigger players. But, um, you know, the refs were really bad in this game, really one-sided. It's just curious how they see Shavar has a foul and then right away dives in the ball. Oh, there's two. He's got to come out of the game. He comes back in for a few minutes in the first half, standing right in the middle of the lane, not moving, doesn't turn. There's your third foul. Gets him right out of the game. It's like it's like they know, like, oh, that here's our shot. Get Shavar out of the game. They're not going to – here here goes Mollett. They're not going to come back from this. Well, we came back anyway. It reminds me of the um, the Georgetown game we won – in 2016, that that was a terribly rough game. The Georgetown game was one of the worst I've seen. And it was one of those games where Justin Robinson and Jalan were like, screw these guys. We're going to go out <laughs> here, play five on eight, and we're still going to win by 17 points or whatever they won by. Yeah, Colin that, Stewart had a great game in that one, too. That's how badly they beat Georgetown that year. They should have won that game by 30. Yep. And because the refs gave Georgetown every chance to come back in the game, they just were, weren't a good team that year. Um, you know, Mammoth just pummeled them anyway. And it reminded me of that a little bit. The, George and Shavar, these guys were like, screw it. We're going to play five on eight anyway. Let's go beat him. And, you know, credit to Wes Miller because he did put together a really good game plan against Mammoth 
defensively. Listen, when you, when your guys shoot four for 28 as a coach, there's not a whole lot you can do besides saying stop shooting threes and go to the basket. <laughs> like there's, there's not a whole lot you can do. Like when, when we play the rec basketball growing up, my dad coached my friend and I, we'd shoot too many threes. He'd be like, stop shooting threes. Get in the middle. If you shoot a three down three, you're coming out of the game. Like <laughs> you, he would yell at us all the time for too many threes. And I felt my dad in the background, like in my ear, like saying stop shooting threes in Cincinnati. <laughs> and besides that, when your team goes four for 28, there's not a whole lot you can do there, but defensively, I mean, they got Shavar in foul trouble. They locked down George really well. Like he could not go anywhere. He was being shadowed the whole game. They were in his face. They weren't letting him get open in transition. And at a certain point, like George was trying to force it a little bit. He was trying to get going. He hit a big one. And then, you know, you see, you saw when he was pulling up, you know, he was kind of like leaning into a shot where typically he's very good at settling himself even in transition he's going 100 miles an hour he stops in a dime rises up to take the shot and he's balanced and he drains a three it seemed like he was kind of like rushing it and almost like leaning into a shot a little bit and it was a little off on saturday but you know they made him run all over the place to try to get open and i'm sure he was exhausted by the end of the game because typically you know you're rewarded for as much work as pappas does off the ball you're rewarded by the threes that you hit and it gives you some more energy when you're not rewarding, you can't get open, you can't hit a shot because of the defense. You got to be exhausted after that. So credit George for sticking to it, but credit Wes for Wes Miller for that game plan because George cannot do anything. And when you have that and you have Shavar on the bench in foul trouble, it makes Mammoth a very, very challenged team in terms of scoring. But other guys picked it up, and we'll get to them in a minute. But luckily for Mammoth, they did just enough on offense to get over the hump. Yeah, one bad. Uh, first, real quick, you said Georgetown. Just anybody who was questioning if the St. Joe's win was a good win for Monmouth or not, St. Joe's just went on the road and beat Georgetown at Georgetown. So Big that win. only helped that win uh, to more validity for Monmouth. Um, one bad thing about going into this matchup was, you know, Wes Miller is watching every single Monmouth game. Yes. You know, whether it's on on repeat or you know whatever it is, and watching his brother Walker finally get those minutes. So. Wes Miller watched, and Wes Miller was a very similar player to George Pappas. If Wes Miller was playing in the mid-major level, he would be having success like George Pappas did, uh, does. But Wes Miller was a walk-on who forced his way into the rotation at UNC with great defense, gritty defense, and some three-point shooting, um, a la Max DeLeo's uh, journey and George's journey from walk-ons to starting shooting guards at, at Monmouth. So... That's one of the problems. He knew that George is the guy that ignites this team offensively. And he had his men face guarding him. And then off of the screens, he had an extra man shading over to him. And that's why other guys were able to score because Cincinnati's defense was so overcommitted to George. And I just want to say, I was worried that George might have had flu-like symptoms. He did not look like he had his legs under him. I don't know if it was, maybe it was just the defense of Cincinnati wore him out, but uh, he didn't look himself out there, so hopefully George is feeling well. Um, George did shoot two for nine, but he did hit two big threes. But he did add five assists, two steals, and four rebounds. He was, he was for the most part, pretty engaged. He did It did look like it was getting in his head a bit where he lost. He missed a couple shots, and then he lost two shooters for Cincinnati for two of their four threes. But again, George regrouped in the second half along with his team. Um, Mammoth's seventh power conference win since 2015, but the first since 2016 when they went to Memphis. So it's been a while uh, for the West Long Branch faithful to enjoy something like this. And, you know, everyone should take uh, an extra moment to enjoy it. No one's going to enjoy it more. We'd say King Rice now has bragging rights over West Miller, but really Walker Miller. Um, McClary was in takeover mode again in the second half. Beast. It reminded me of the St. Joe's game. He ended up with 18 points, 7 of 14, 2 for 2 from 3. And it could have easily been 20, but he missed two free throws. Can't have that. Grabbed six boards, added three assists. And even the Cincinnati commentators, they were gushing over Marcus McClary's play, his heart, his hustle, and what he means to the Monmouth basketball team. I mean, maybe the confidence was always there. And it just didn't show up because he wasn't the star. He wasn't getting as many minutes or scoring as much or getting as many shots. But he looks like a completely different guy out there. Like, we always knew he was confident defensively. We always knew he could make a shot or two or drive the basket. 
he is looking like an all-conference player, which I don't think any of us could have predicted coming into the year. I mean, the look on his face in this game, there's no smiles for Marcus McClary. In the past, he'd get a stop and a dunk or something, and he'd be smiling on the court. Marcus McClary is not doing any smiling this year until they're in the locker room. That guy is as serious as can be. He is taking people out. He's driving to the basket, dunking on people, hitting threes, breaking guys' ankles, hitting step back stuff he has not done very often at all the last four years. He is a completely different guy out there. I don't know what happened over the offseason. I don't know who said something to him. If he went to some type of guru and they messed with his mind a little bit, and now he's this different player, I'll, I'll tell you what, he has completely taken a different role on this team. And without Marcus McClary, I mean, this team would not be 5-1. and one. I'll, I'll tell you right now. You know, we talk about Shavar coming in and Walker coming in and Pappas coming back. And we said it was always important that Marcus came back. It was a big piece. But if Marcus does not come back to this team, they're not 5-1. and one. They're probably 3-3. Three and three. So it's a huge testament to Marcus' work and coming back. And, I mean, I, I just I can't really describe how he's doing what he's doing. But he just looks like a whole different guy out there with a whole different level of confidence. And then we get to Shavar. Shavar was limited to 17 minutes in this one, not because of the flu but because of fouls, and we already went over two of the foul calls were highly questionable. One thing I have to say is at Seton Hall, Shavar should have dove on that ball. Shavar should have stepped in and tried to take a charge. At Monmouth, he shouldn't be doing those things because he's too important for this team to take a foul, an unnecessary foul. Do you agree, Ryan? 100%. I mean, he, he's got to be smart where, and again, that's also Shavar – getting used to this role. Like he is the star here. He is the alpha dog. He is the, the number one guy here. And you can talk about George scoring more points, maybe, or Walker doing his thing in Marcus, but Shavar is the number one guy on this team. And he's got to realize that he's, he's been the number four or five or six guy in the past at Seton Hall. He's the number one guy now. So we need you on that court for 35 minutes. So not to say that he's not going to play hard because you know what he's going to do. Like he's going to keep dying for that ball. He's going to keep doing those things. But he's got to also keep in the back of his mind, I got to stay in this game as long as possible. I can't be getting these ticky-tack fouls 90 feet from the basket and the kind of the careless fouls. He's got to be a little more careful with that because eventually when you're playing Iona, Patino is going to find a way to bait him into fouls. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's going to happen. So mm-hmm. he's got to be smart where, all right, especially against certain teams, I got to really watch myself because if I come out, I get two fouls in the first five minutes, my team's without me for 15 minutes and then some more in the second half, we're going to lose this game. And eventually it's going to cost them. So hopefully Shavar starts getting the idea where I really can't be fouling out of these games. I got to be on the court for 30, 35 minutes minimum. And I got to take care of myself. out there. Yeah. And he was so hot early at 10 in the first half, despite limited minutes, he ended up with 14 on six of seven shooting. If he didn't end up in foul trouble, one of two things were going to happen. Either he was going to drop 30 as Cincinnati kept overplaying on George, or Cincinnati was going to have to change the way they were defending George, and Pappas would have had some open looks, and you know what happens there. So if Shavar didn't end up in this foul trouble, this game wouldn't have even been a two-point game, I don't think. I think Mama no. would have won by about 12, and I think Shavar would have had 30, or George would have gotten uncorked. So that that is that's how important he is, and, and how big of a difference Shavar being on the court for 30-plus minutes or Shavar being on the court under 20 minutes is for this team. Um, Walker Miller in the Battle of the Bros, he showed a really nice offensive arsenal. He had 13 points on 5 11 shooting. He hit a three early on, and he kind of winked and pointed over at his brother. He made both of his free throws again. And Ryan, he looked like the best big man on the floor, despite going up against higher-rated frontline players on the Cincinnati roster. And that really says something as – Walker now should not be intimidated, nor will he be overmatched by the likes of Nellie Jr. Joseph, Jackson Stormo, Kevin Marfo, or any big man found in the MAC. Yeah, I mean, he, there's no reason he should because he's gone against some of the best bigs in the country for the last four years in practice. Now he's doing it in games and showing no fear. He hits that little teardrop. I mean, I, I don't even understand how he gets the shot off. He he doesn't even – it's not even a shot almost. It's almost like a throw. He he almost – like a, a soft throw over his shoulder, and the ball just swishes through the bottom of the basket. I mean, it's such a unique shot that he's got down. 
and he should. Be it's hard to take, defend. It's really hard to defend. He he takes such an awkward angle when he takes that shot, and when you get a guy like that that's shooting such a high clip from the free throw line, a high clip from the field, and can get you into foul trouble, any defense, any he can run a little bit in transition. That's a really really hard guy to deal with, and so far he hasn't gotten into too much foul trouble, only a little bit here and there, and. He's going to be very tough on the other Mac bigs. I know those other guys are going to get the attention because they've been in the league a little longer. Walker's going to give those guys a lot of problems this year. I'm telling you right now. Yeah, and um, my battle cry of Walker being the uh, the find of the transfer portal. Uh, All Facts Media actually tweeted that out when they were talking about their interview with George that that uh, he might have been the the find of the transfer portal, and he really really has been. Um, really DK Ruddy back showed no ill effects from the flu he was super active all night long often having to play center as walker dealt with the foul trouble and ruddy chipped in with eight boards three steals and a block against a really physical bearcat front line and then you look at the mammoth bench a combined 55 minutes so more they had to go deeper and with more minutes than usual despite having the full complement of players due to foul trouble and foster ruth chapu and teron allen again in there Combined for nine points, uh, six of them from Foster really played a hell of a game on both ends of the ball in this one. He yeah. defended Davenport really well. And Davenport is one of those like six, six rangy swing forwards who came in as Cincy's second leading scorer. And he had a really tough day. And part of it was Foster using his wingspan against him. Uh, the Monmouth bench also added eight rebounds and five, six, five assists. And that's a lot of production from a bench that up until Princeton really wasn't needed very much this year. Uh, the recent performances of MU's bench squad offers an encouraging sign as that next man up mentality will be needed over a long and grueling season. Yeah, I mean, in Mac play, like King told us in practice, there's never a night off in the Mac. I mean, I think Canisius is a little bit weaker, but when we go there next week, it's not going to be an easy game. They are not going to just lay, lay down because we're moms who are coming in there with a 5-1 and one record. They're coming at us because now we have a target on our back. We have two big wins in our resume now, really three big wins. And now we're going to be a target just like Iona. And mom has got to go into those games the same way they went to all these games. And, you know, there's never a night off in the MAC. There just isn't. So, you know, they're going to need every bit of that bench. They're going to need Foster and Ruth and Chapu and Allen and all the other guys that we really haven't seen yet. They're going to need everybody because eventually – Guys get banged up. Guys aren't healthy. You know, God forbid COVID hits the locker room. They're going to need the whole bench, and they're going to need this whole team playing together. And, you know, right now we're not going to start talking about it just yet because I know it's early. But when you look at each of these games now, as you're 5-1, and one, if you stay with that one loss for as long as possible, those talks of that large bids are going to start creeping in. Again, it's too early, but – the more you're winning and the more you keep that one or two loss mark, those talks are going to happen, whether it's there or not, whether you want it or not. So, you know, each of those games are going to be even more important now, and they're going to need every part of that bench in order to keep winning these games. Yeah, and that hashtag two bid Mac, poor Josh Newman. I saw multiple <laughs> people uh, tweeting at him about that, and Guy Filatico and J uh, Jaden Daly. It's already being talked about that if Mammoth and Iona can continue to limit their losses and get these notable wins in the non-conference, that if the rest of the MAC continues to play better than usual in out of conference, that maybe this could be a hashtag two bid MAC. But we know how that goes with the NCAA tournament selection committee. Speaking of that 2015-16 Mammoth team. Um, Mac play begins with the dreaded Buffalo trip. Yep. And I worry, as I think back to 2015, Monmouth came off their impressive start, flying off high off a uh, weekend where they upset both Notre Dame and USC and Disney World, only to fall victim to Canisius to open Mac play. Canisius hit 16 threes that night to shock the Hawks. Let's hope that there is no hangover from the last five wins, including the big victory over Cincy on the long bus trip up to Buffalo. I would think that with the maturity and the experience of this team, we won't see them overlooking anyone or getting too high or too low at any point throughout the season. Yeah, I mean, you got to think King is going to talk to them about that exact game that we're talking about. Yeah, I would show them the film. 
I, I would. I mean, he, he knows what happened that week. And in the end, when you were looking on ESPN of why Monmouth got snubbed, that they came back to that loss and the Manhattan loss and the Army loss. Even though Army, we lost to them when they had a full lineup and they were supposed to win the yep. Patriot League. And then all four guys got hurt and they mm-hmm. tanked the rest of the year. So that really wasn't a fair estimate of what happened. They don't really look into that stuff and they should. But the Canisius and the Manhattan losses, although two very tough, well coached MAC teams, they had RPI around like the 200s, 230s, and they were considered bad losses. And, you know, I, I've known a couple of Division I coaches outside of King Rice in my life, and they tell me every single conference game is a war. Like every game is a war, and you don't know mm-hmm. who's going to be playing who that night. You don't, you know each other so well. And it doesn't matter if it's the top team versus the bottom team. You know each other and play each other twice a year every year. You know each other's recruits. You know what they do. And everyone is prepared for each other. It's not a Cincinnati where Monmouth comes in and they're not quite prepared and they don't really know what we do. Canisius knows what we do. Niagara knows what we do. So, you know, every game is a battle and a war. So you have to be able to come in there with the same mentality that they're coming for us just like we're coming for them. And we're not going to surprise anybody. We just got to play our game and go out and get a W. So the first game is at Niagara, Friday night, December 3rd, 7 p.m., ESPN Plus for anyone looking for the game. Uh, Niagara comes in at two and three, but they hung in against Xavier, losing by three on opening night, and against number 10, Ohio State, losing by 10. They'll play at Colgate, who just scored 100 in the Carrier Dome, upsetting Syracuse last week. They'll play them on Monday, the 29th, before welcoming the Hawks on December 3rd. So diving into who Niagara is this year, one guy that you want to look out for after a down season last year, six foot three senior guard number 10, Marcus Hammond is back. And he's back to being arguably the best guard or the best individual player in the MAC. Nearly 20 points per game, 3.8 rebounds per game. Everybody knows how much I love this kid's game and wish that he came to Monmouth out of Cardozo High School. He's long, he's athletic, he can stroke it with that pretty lefty jumper. Containing him, will be key for a Hawk victory. It won't get much better in the MAC this season than a Friday night Shavar Reynolds, Marcus Hammond star matchup at the lead guard. Um, key newcomer for Niagara, six foot seven senior, number 22, Sam Iorio, nine and a half points, four rebounds per game. He transferred in from South Alabama and sat out last year per the old transfer rules. He's a tall kid with a nice outside stroke who can really score the basketball and plays well off of Marcus Hammond. They have a six foot three Juco transfer, number 21, Noah Thomason, eight and a half points per game. And he's displayed a strong three point percentage, uh, hitting over 50% and 91% of his free throws. So he's got a good touch to compliment Hammond in the backcourt up in Niagara. Like Iorio, he's a guy you have to pay attention to at all times, because if you turn to help on Hammond, these two guys will make you pay. One more key cog is six foot eight senior number five, Jordan Cintron. He's that super athletic, bouncy big. He gave Mammoth fits last season. Niagara went into like a press. He had a steal and a highlight reel jam that was similar to Marcus Han- uh, Marcus McClary's. Uh, he's off to a good start, seven and a half points, five rebounds this season, and he dropped 17 and six on Ohio State. And then when you talk about X factor for this team, it's a guy who's been around a while. Six foot six, senior forward, number 15, Greg Quacamensa. 7.8 points per game, 3.6 rebounds per game. He's a lefty, undersized power forward with a good handle and an array of moves a la 90s Nick Anthony Mason. Unfortunately for Greg, it seems Sam Iorio's arrival has limited his role on this team. He's only playing 18 minutes per game and is extremely inconsistent. Look at his game log for his points in, the, in, their, uh, in their first five contests. Six points, zero points, 15 points, 13 points, five points. He's a guy that can totally swing a game their way when he pops off the bench as the sixth man. Yeah, I mean, Niagara, they've played well all year so far. Um, they, I mean, they, they did beat Xavier, right? They weren't close. They beat Xavier. No, they, I believe they lost by three. Okay, I knew they were in that yeah. game. I, forget they, I saw a tweet the other day. I wasn't sure if it was right or not, but they were right with Xavier. So that alone shows you this Niagara team is capable. And they're coached by um, former Duke co- player uh, Greg Paulus. So you know this team's going to come out. Like you, If you ever saw him play at Duke, 
never the best player. It's amazing, like, with his talent level that he was actually a starter at Duke. Like, the guy was not a talented superstar playing at Duke. Like, he was just a tough, tough kid. And that's what he's doing with this Niagara team. They are not going to be the most talented team in the MAC, but they're going to come at you every night. And they do have the star in Marcus Hammond. But they are a team that's going to be scrappy, and they're going to keep coming at you. And I do not expect Monmouth, even playing at their best level, to win this game by double digits. It's, I think it's going to be a dogfight, and it's one that I expect to pull away at the very end. Um, but I do not expect to be blowing out Niagara. Um, it just doesn't seem to happen to Greg Paul's teams. Yeah, and I think that they encompass a lot of what Greg Paul's is all about. They they encompass that toughness, sharing the ball, and uh, he he does put these kids in good spots. I think last year um, they had a big time player, Nwandu, leave and go pro a year early, so they're missing him. But um, Iorio and Thomason coming in kind of make up for that. And when we went through those guys, there's there's a nice complement of players around a superstar with guys who could step up and beat you any given night. So. That will not be a cakewalk for Monmouth. Um, next up, then they go to Canisius on Sunday, December 5th, a 1 o'clock p.m. start on ESPN3. Right up against NFL kickoff. Great job, oh. Rich Ensor. Every time. Uh, Every time. I, I can't stand it. So, so, and you know me, like, I'll, I'll be double screening. It'll be fine. But there won't be the crowd. I mean, especially, well, actually, the Bills play on Monday night. So, maybe they will get a nice crowd over the weekend. Um Bills Pats Monday night division on the line. Gotta love it. <laughs> um, Kenesha's scouting report. Kenesha's comes in at two and four with one of their wins coming against a non D one team. They did have a notable loss 69 60 versus top 25 St. Bonaventure squad. And they will host Cornell on Monday, the 29th before this contest, December 5th. Um, Ryan and I have said from the beginning, we think Kenesha's is the worst team in the Mac but they do have some dangerous players. And um, when you start looking at them, it starts with six foot seven senior forward, number two, Malik Green. He's their go-to guy. He averages over 16 points, six and a half rebounds. He's a load on the block as he's very strong, but he can also step out and bang jumpers and threes on you. He's actually one of the more complete forwards in the Mac, and he'll be a tall task for Nikkei Ruddy and the Hawks. Six foot five junior wing, number 11, Armand Harid. 12 and a half points per game is a guy I always thought would eventually turn into a max star from the moment I saw him as a freshman, but his inconsistency shooting the ball continues to hold him back from what other, what is otherwise a very good basketball player. This year he scored 22 points twice in games where he made four and six threes, but he's also had a game without a single field goal and some single digit scoring games. He's athletic and strong and needs to be stopped on his drives and crowded on his threes to not allow him to get going early. Then they have a six foot six sophomore wing number five. And I will admit, I went to the Canisius website, the media pronunciation guide for this one, because if you see the way this guy's name is spelled, you would have no idea how to say it either. His first name is Seam, and the last name is Ait Tendal. And the way that it's spelled is U I J T E N D A A L. So good luck with that for anyone calling that game. He averages 12 a game and is a three-point sniper, but he hasn't played in their last three games. So I'll be checking on Monday to see if that kid's back in the lineup against Cornell or not. Uh, and then they have six foot ten junior big man number 10, Yako Fritz. Eight and a half points, almost seven boards. He operates in the high and the low post. He has a really great feel for the game, and he's a good player in that Canisius system. Their X factor is the six foot five senior wing number three, Jordan Henderson. Kind of shoots it the same way. Uh, with his form, the same way Deion Hammond shot it, has a similar body type, wears the number three, 8.8 uh, 8. 8 points per game, but his season high was 13 against a non-Division one school. So he'll let it fly from deep any chance he gets. We want him to have a two for seven or a one for eight night and not one of his four for six or six for six for nine nights from three. If he's hot and gets open looks, he could really swing a game the Golden Griff's way. It's up to Monmouth to close out on all of their three-point shooters and just try to negate uh, Big Malik inside to grab a win. So we got a lot of Facebook questions, and we are pushing up against an hour, so we are going to fly through these, all right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, uh, yeah, 
I, I time flies when you're having fun on a five game winning streak. <laughs> Listen, right? this is a great podcast. We said it was going to be. Um, no rants on this one, but definitely a good one. Um, all right, from hey, Joe. We have a little rant about the uh, the refs in the Power Five arenas. Yeah, mild mild rant. I, I can go harder on that one though. I can definitely go <laughs> a lot. I, I Pace yourself. On, it's a long season. I went harder on that one on Saturday during the game, so I got it all out all of the right. way. Um, from Joe on Facebook. Um, I see the Buffalo games as a potential letdown. Um, on paper, neither contest should pose a problem. That's on paper. You're right about that. Uh, the Buffalo trip has always been a challenge. Canisius and Niagara would like nothing better than stop the streak. I agree. Um, it is a potential letdown spot. I do think we win both games. I, do, I really do. I think the Canisius one, we should win pretty handily, but the Niagara game posed a little concern. Um, and most years where you're not 5-1, and one, you're hoping to at least get a split up there, but when your record's five and one and people are talking about things they're talking about, um, you definitely want to get both of those games, get to seven and one going into St. John's and the rest of out of conference play. Um, Mark, I'll give you this one. What matchups from Kathleen, what matchups should we watch for in the two Buffalo games? Yeah, we gave you the X factors. We gave you the, the big, uh, big players on each team. If you want me to tell you a matchup, I like seeing, Harid match up against McClary as they're both big wings and uh, strong athletic kids who can totally turn the tide. And I love the Marcus Hammond, Shavar Reynolds matchup. I just hope Shavar doesn't get any cheap fouls <laughs> against him. All right. Brian on Facebook. I know it's looking far ahead, but could you see a way for mom to get in that large bet to the dance looking at the schedule? Would they need to beat both Pitt and St. John's or could one suffice with two wins uh, against Yale, Cornell, Hofstra and maybe um, a two or three, two or possibly three loss conference run. I wasn't around for the Robinson year that they were put out, so I can't really compare. So in my opinion, um, you have to win Pitt because Pitt is not going to have a good RPI yep. ranking. I think you have to be Pitt. I think we will be Pitt. Honestly, they are not a very good team. Uh, I think you got to get that one. They just Pitt just lost to Ray Salmave in UMBC the other night. They gave up yeah. 85 points. So I think you could afford to lose to St. John's, possibly. It would be a great win to get. If you beat St. John's, you're right in that discussion. Now, now there's no going back. The discussion's on about that at large. But, yeah. whether but Ryan, won- here's the problem. Ryan, yeah. the problem is Yale is expected to be a top two or three Ivy League team. It's actually Colgate, not Cornell. Colgate already has a 100-point yeah. win against Syracuse. And Hofstra's taken two top 25 teams to the wire. So the problem is winning those games don't do a lot for you unless those teams pretty much run the table in their conferences, but they hurt you if you lose them. So yeah. um, they help your they help your RPI, they help your strength of schedule, they help you net. Um, St. John's would be another great resume win, in my opinion. St. John's actually is escaping these wins. The other night they beat NJIT, it took overtime. They're escaping these wins, so they're playing with fire a lot. So maybe Mammoth can get in there and take advantage of them being a little lackadaisical, which is surprising for a Mike Anderson team. Um, but yet, Mike, just uh, uh, Brian, sorry, my my apologies, Brian. To tell you the truth, I don't know what you can do more than what Mammoth did um, in 2016, except for avoid what jump off the page as bad losses. Yeah, I mean, you have to expect they're going to lose two or three conference games. You, you just have to like. Realistic expectations, Monmouth goes 16 and 4 in conference. I think that's realistic and a, and a good goal. I think in order to get at large bid, you really can't lose more than two or three MAC games, unless they're both to Iona, which, God forbid, I'll lose my mind if they lose both, but it'd be miserable. But I mean, if you lose two to Iona with a high high net and one other game, maybe you got a shot if you lose maybe two out of conference games. But I, I just feel like it's just such an uphill climb. And if you lose more than one more at a conference game, it's, it's going to be tough. If you lose St. John's and maybe one more, you get a shot. But really, you really can't afford to lose more than one more. Um, Robert, I think if we get through the Buffalo trip with a sweep, then we can talk about St. John's, Pitt, and beyond. This team is different from the past teams, obviously, with the added maturity, um, with George and Marcus, graduate transfers, Miller and Reynolds, overcome the hiccup on the road. Um while he enjoys the thought, I think it is a bit early to talk about Matt getting, getting two bids. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it is early, and we got to see with the way the next month goes. In a month, listen, if a month from now, Mom's sitting at 11 and 2, 12 and 1, 
yeah, I mean, we're talking about it. That's, that's happening. But if, you know, we're sitting there at, you know, eight and four, I think it kind of goes away and you're just talking about finishing as the one or two seed in the Mac and going for the tournament in AC. Um, Greg, love the depth of this team and would like to know the, de- the status of Vaughn and Ruga. We have nothing on that. Um, we have no inside information. They have not given us anything. Um, neither one has been dressed for any game. So it would great. It would be great to think they're back in a couple weeks, but we really don't have any answer on that. Um, Rosaland, I'm very impressed with the Hawks, and I would love to see more of you guys. Rosaland, we're in. I'm in section J, or I'm in section K. Marks and and J. So come on anytime and say hi. Um, yeah, and it's gonna take a, a lot more than a a, a five game winning streak or a two game losing streak to shut us up. Don't worry. <laughs> we'll be here every week. Um, <laughs> All right, Mike. Uh, I'm gonna, Mike. I'm sorry. I'm gonna run through your comment a little quick because we are way out of time here. Um, I don't think anybody was predicting a five and one November. I would have to agree. I think four and two was kind of realistic, but five and one is definitely impressive. Um, you're right, Mike. King Rice has done an outstanding, ex, uh, outstanding job of in-game adjustments. We mentioned that earlier. Um, second half splits are astounding. Absolutely spot on there. Um, Mike's saying that, you know, he doesn't like the comments about if we didn't make it in 15, 16, that we'll never make it. He disagrees because of the Nets rankings and the way they've changed the criteria. Really, they changed it after Mount didn't get in. We were kind of one of the driving forces of how they changed it. So Mike is right there. Um, I, I mean, listen, I, I do agree that it is definitely an uphill climb, but if you don't lose the bad games and you win enough, it is going to give you a shot in the end. I still think it's it's going to be really difficult to get a second Mac team in, but it depends what the rest of the conference does the rest of the season. And if everybody can pull their weight and nobody has, you know, we don't have three 20 lost teams. Yeah. They'll have a shot in the end to get a second bid, but um, it's not going to be easy. And the last one from bill um, defensive strategy, much improved um, the zone and mid court trap pressure King called a few critical timeouts, great in, in game management. Um, Marcus, the MVP with St. John's coming up, um, mom is right for another win. I agree, Bill. I mean, I definitely think they got a shot against St. John's Marcus has been, if not the MVP, one of two MVPs in this team, he has done an outstanding job and it's been a lot of fun watching him ball out this year. Can't wait to watch the Buffalo trip from the warmth of my couch. And, uh, hopefully next week we'll be talking about Mammoth being seven and one and more importantly, two and oh in the Mac, because as we know, no matter how important Cincinnati, St. John's, Princeton, how important those wins feel, nothing is more important than winning as many Mac games as you can in the regular season to get a one seed or a two seed and a first round bye. All right. So we got Niagara Friday night on ESPN plus we got Kanisha Sunday afternoon on ESPN3. I guess it's ESPN3 or ESPN+. Plus. And just in case you were wondering, UNC's next game is versus Michigan on Wednesday night at 15. <laughs> if you want to root against them with me in the Big Ten ACC Challenge, go Big Ten, go Michigan. Let's hope for a Michigan 20-point loss, 20-point uh, win over UNC. All right, thanks, everybody, for listening. Have a great night. 51 to 59.